Hey Internet, so this is going to be one of those fun subscriber milestone videos where I just go over some question and answers, and as well as got some channel updates, which I will save for the end of the video. And I'll be doing this whole thing as one of my game rants, which are basically just simpler video essays or unscripted hot takes that have some retro gaming and some memes for fun. This is actually a really fun ROM hack of the original Zelda for the NES that turns the game into a roguelike with just a randomly generated dungeon. It's actually pretty good. So I shall include a link to it in the description below. Anyways, let's get started. When will you stop coping? I don't know, when will you stop seething? <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect me to answer that one? Oh boy. Okay, here's a better question. As a Hoppian, does that mean you completely reject the concept of governments altogether, or are you more of a minarchist? Also, given I assume you like freedom of association, I assume that includes freedom to discriminate, not dealing with certain people, or are you more on the enforced anti-discrimination side? That's a better question. Uh, now we can actually get into something. So yeah, I am a Hoppian Austro-Libertarian. For those who do not know, that basically means just decentralizing the government by breaking it up into privately owned factions that then have to compete with each other. And as for freedom of association, that's probably the big thing that makes Hoppians more on the dissident right side of things. So your standard issue, sort of Gary Johnson style of libertarian, the main thing that they believe that people like me don't believe, like the, the biggest difference that will make a change to the average person, would probably be open borders. Therefore, just completely opening the borders, which where people like me will say something more like, that is incredibly cringe because you can't have open borders in a state with a massive welfare system that is not based on freedom of association. So, of course, that's a very cringe idea. As that gives third worlders a very perverse incentive to come in, despite not actually having any skills or education, and then immediately claim to be oppressed. As where Hoppians will be more like, okay, if you want to have that kind of border, it actually makes more sense to privatize the borders and have freedom of association. It's a very complex system. The best way to understand it easily is to read Hans Hermann Hoppe's essay on the case for free trade and restricted immigration. I basically agree with 99% of what's in that essay. It does a relatively good job of highlighting one of the main important differences between like a standard left-leaning or libertarian centrist versus a right-wing libertarian like myself. Do you think you'll be covering and debunking anti-capitalist and anti-liberty people from the right sometime soon? Uh yeah, I'll occasionally go into what I consider to be boomer cuckservatism, where a lot of Republicans make the mistake of falling for a lot of leftist talking points without realizing it, and this sort of running joke that Republicans are just Democrats minus 20 years. And what do you think is the best way for us as right libertarians to garner more support and gain more power with the current political sphere we find ourselves in? That is a good question. The answer to that for now is honestly just being more open-minded and be more willing to work with people who don't have the exact same ideology that you have. And that way you can convince others of things that you believe that you are right about without coming across as pushy or annoying. I personally believe that the best way to look at ideologies is to look at them as a tier list. You, you obviously have whatever you believe at the top, but you don't want to be one of those people who you just want to be my way or the highway. You don't want to think of it as my ideology, god tier, everyone else's ideology, crap tier. You want to look at it as, okay, here's what I believe, and then here's some ideologies that I don't quite agree with, but I consider them A tier. They're, they would be better than the current system. So if we can go with them as a compromise with other people, then that's fine. Like, for instance, a lot of classical liberal type right-wingers could probably agree with Austro-Libertarians on Georgism. We might be able to have a Georgist minarchist government instead. Is that what either of us actually want? Is that the most ethical and most efficient system? No, but it's way better than what we currently have. <laughs> anyway, next question. What bread tuber do you want to refute next? So currently I'm actually working on a video with Hakim. Tankies have a tendency to make a very consistent reasoning mistakes when they kind of come up with their conspiracies that they believe in. And that video would be highlighting that problem. But as for other bread tubers, I have been recently been made aware of a certain reasoning error that Illuminati and a lot of other bread tubers make, so I might go with that instead. I've noticed that a lot more bread tubers than just Sean have a tendency to create the fallacy fallacy argument where they point to a very ridiculous version of something someone on the right said and messed up on. And then they will pretend that that cherry-picked bad take is the mainstream right-wing opinion, when it's obviously not. So I may go with that as the next BreadTube episode instead. And yeah, I could do videos on debunking some anti-libertarian arguments as well. I kind of already do that. Have you always been libertarian or libertarian-leaning? So when I was younger, like an early teenager, I actually used to have a very similar ideology to Destiny. So yes, I was a shameless neoliberal. Then as I studied more economics, I moved more towards libertarian centrism, and then as Clown World continued, I eventually found my way moving more and more towards the libertarian right. 
Especially when I started reading Hans Hermann Hoppe and realized that a lot of the things that he's noticed about society are very similar to the things that I've noticed about society. Mainly in how leftists don't really apply reason to their understanding of how the world operates. Most of them just kind of start from the moralistic fallacy or the ought-is fallacy and then they create dogma out of that and then they just look for whatever empirical data they can find in order to justify their ridiculous reasoning giving it an academic gloss and making it seem like their fallacious reasoning has some kind of factual basis when it really doesn't. What do you think of H. Bomber Guy's take of everyone who criticizes the left for any reason whatsoever is literally funny mustache man? Well, that one's pretty obvious. It's ridiculous reasoning. That's kind of the main ridiculous grift of BreadTube. They don't actually have very good arguments, so instead they just have to demonize their opponents. And they don't really seem to care if they come across as a clown when doing that. Although the worst example probably isn't H Bomber Guy, it's still really Adam Something's video on right wing libertarians being bundle of sticksism. And within that video, of course, Adam demonstrates that he knows absolutely nothing about the Austrian School of Economics and probably has never even read anything from the Mises Institute. Next up, when will you stand up and finally debate Vosh? So Vush is actually one of those people who believes in something called responsible platforming, so he basically will just ignore me. Oh well. But honestly, doing well-researched work into refuting his points is better. Vooch is very good at taking fallacious reasoning and incorrect information and spinning them in the rhetorical machine to make them sound and framed better so that it, it sounds like he actually knows what he's talking about. Of course, then when you actually fact-check him, you find out that what he's saying is either fallacious or nonsensical or not actually true. Like, for instance, how the coconut island analogy is basically just an ignoratio elenchi fallacy. And yet leftists still praise it to this day as if they still think it's a good argument. Plus, I don't think the debate culture within YouTube is in a very good spot right now. We still let people get away with arguing in bad faith, and people still don't know why you should take away points from people who are acting intentionally obnoxious to try and make their opponent irritated. Because what Vosh and a lot of other leftists honestly will do, like Hassan Abbey does this too, is he will interrupt someone, and then make some really stupid smug response, which then makes them irritated with them, and then they'll just continue acting smug, and because of the framing effect, people will think that the guy acting smug is correct, when in reality, when you fact-check them after the debate, you find out that everything they're saying was total nonsense. And I believe more viewers of these debates need to become aware of that kind of tactic, and why it's not actually good, and why you should actually view people who act this way as losing the debate, not winning the debate. There's kind of this falsehood going around that the first person to get angry loses, when in reality it's the first person who acts like a smug prick who is actually losing. Many right-wingers are pointing to El Salvador's recent crime crackdown as evidence that expanding law enforcement powers and tough-on-crime policies work. Is there any truth to that? Now, I haven't actually seriously looked into what's going on in El Salvador right now, but I will say this. The government performing a necessary function of society is better than absolutely no one performing that function of society. That doesn't mean it's the best way, but society definitely needs some kinds of rights for protection in order to function. However, in regards to El Salvador, I do know that they have a history of incompetent government, so I'm sure whatever they did do, even though I'm not looking into it and I'm doing this mostly unscripted, I'm sure whatever they did is probably dumb in some very silly way and will probably have some kind of negative repercussion. Anyway, next question. How can a small country defend itself from an invasion for a long period of time? By small, I mean city-state size. So the basic way that is done is by insurance and defense contracts. As long as big states exist that pose a threat, smaller states will need to sort of cooperate with each other and sign defense contracts with each other. So that way they can defend each other against a larger state if they decide to invade. That's just kind of an unfortunate reality that you have to accept. And those smaller countries should also make sure that they are engaging in free trade with each other, as that basically guarantees that they have an incentive to maintain peace with each other. And of course, free trade with the larger countries disincentivizes the larger countries to even invade in the first place. Next up, if you could have added an amendment to the Constitution when it was written with the intent of slowing the acquisition of power to the government, what would you write? That's another good one. I'm going to assume that you mean we have to stick with a democratic minarchist government that the United States originally wanted to be. Uh, one way that they could have tried to keep that in place would be to constitutionally limit the amount of money that the government can spend based on private GDP. Maybe at a max of around 10 percent, and then also include in the Constitution that Congress is only allowed to vote to reduce that number, not raise it. I'm fairly certain the state would eventually screw this up anyway, but it would have definitely slowed the progress down. Basically, the economic portions of Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution gave the government way too much power and basically doomed us from the start by not having any kind of real objective limitations. 
leading into Congress going, oh, hey, we can just vote to give ourselves more power. Yay. And 200 years later, clown world. What's your opinion on minarchism? Well, minarchism is definitely a lot better than what we currently have, but it is not as good as decentralization. That's pretty much it, really. I try not to push that discussion too hard because I think it's important for us to avoid impurity spiraling with other right wingers. Do you enjoy what you are doing? Well, yeah, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. I don't think people realize that small channels like mine basically earn zero money for the amount of work that we do. I started this channel purely because I realized I wasn't really doing anything productive for the world at all. I mean, I was keeping myself afloat financially, but that's just not good enough for me. And I honestly wish I had realized this sooner because I considered starting this channel almost 10 years ago and just sat on it instead. Like my video on refuting the Wikipedia article on Gamergate, I should have released that a long time ago, and I'm honestly sorry that I didn't. I actually sincerely owe the internet an apology for my procrastination on that one. Next up, political strategies to actually influence the current system. There's a lot of things you can do. One thing I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make ideas more simple and easier to understand. Right now, those of us in the libertarian right sector, and really the entire right in general, have a very big problem, which is that our more complex philosophical concepts are genuinely too difficult for many to sort of immediately grasp. And this is especially true for us Austro-libertarians. This is actually why BreadTube managed to blow up, in my opinion. A lot of what they have to say genuinely appeals to the genuine pain and suffering of the common man. And the socialist talking points they sell as a solution to the problems are very easy on a surface, instinctual level for the average person to immediately get. That obviously does not mean that what they are saying is correct, as something being easier to understand has no relation whatsoever to whether or not it is true, that's just a personal incredulity thing, but it does make for a very effective grift, and that's why BreadTube grew up so well. Now, the right, we kind of have a midwit meme problem. We have a lot of rhydoids on the lower end of the intellectual curve who still think that Q is coined to save them and expel the satanic elites or whatever, which of course leads to a lot of very bad schizo takes from them that are very easy for these bread tubers in the middle to refute. So we need to work on ways to make the more complex right-wing philosophy more understandable because being correct doesn't help if 99% of the population can't comprehend or relate to what we are saying. Are there any policies or economic theories that Keynesians advocate for that you support? Well, at least Keynesians understands that you still need a market, so Johnny Boy had some bad ideas, but he wasn't completely insane, as it does at least advocate for the private sector. Next, what was the inspiration for your channel name? Well, Mentis means of sound mind, and Wave means just the second part of synth wave, so that's just a kind of combination of two words. But also, I mainly created this name because it has zero other results on Google. Of course, now if you Google my name, you'll actually find it. But I wanted to also come up with something that was interesting and witty, but had nobody else using. And next up is, is spreading disease considered a violation of the nap? Oh, that's actually a fun one. Okay, so any kind of intentional damaging of the commons will indirectly damage other people's private property. So yes, if you're doing it intentionally, that would be a violation of non-aggression. For instance, let's say, we'll just come up with a crazy scenario. Let's say someone is intentionally poisoning the atmosphere in a way that will eventually completely make the planet unbreathable. That is a violation of the NAP because you're making it so that everybody else's private property no longer has air. So yeah, that would be considered aggression. However, if you're unintentionally spreading disease, like if you're just sick and you don't know it, not really. And if you think about it, this is actually something that our current laws kind of understand. If someone goes around intentionally spreading disease, like if you go into a store and you're intentionally coughing all over all the food products, the store does have a right to press charges against you for that. But if you're just walking around and you're sick and you don't know it, well, nobody actually holds you accountable for that because you can't possibly know. But yes, intentionally damaging your surroundings in a way that it, it ends up damaging other people's private property, the, yeah, that would be a violation. Same thing with something like pouring toxic sludge into a river that other people are also utilizing. That's actually just kind of the general way that the Austrian model handles environmental issues. You prevent tragedy of the commons by actually privatizing the commons, that way when anybody does something stupid to the environment, it's considered aggression because they are negatively affecting other people's property. Next up, nationalizing healthcare arguments. So that's what I might get to around the same time that I get to with intellectual property. I'll definitely be doing a video on intellectual property sometime. Not sure when, because I've, I've got quite a few ideas in the cooker. 
That's one problem with me. I'm one of those creators who doesn't really have a problem figuring out new video ideas. I have a problem coming up with way too many. And then I have to sit back and tell myself, okay, yeah, you need to actually pick one of these videos and focus on that video so that it actually gets done. But a short answer to nationalizing healthcare, a lot of it comes down to the intellectual property rights debate, because the American healthcare system is honestly not that bad. The problem is that it just costs way too much because we have medical monopolies, which are enforced by incredibly draconian IP rights. And this actually kind of goes back to the whole boomer conservative issue that I mentioned before. I don't think the average Republican really understands how much IP rights actually benefit the left a lot more than they benefit the right these days. And even if you just completely ignore the Austrian ethics of why intellectual property is basically fake and cringe, there's actually even a utilitarian argument, as bad as that is, that you could argue to a Republican for why you would want to drastically reduce intellectual property rights right now. Next question, Sticks and Hammer. Eh, he's okay, I guess. There's some issues there, but they're not worth going over because he still makes enough okay content that it doesn't really matter. I will admit that I don't really watch him that much, though. I have two. How should libertarians avoid the purity races of other ideologies? Okay, here's a good question now, because I've got a lot to say on this one. And I kind of already answered it earlier, but I'll say a bit more now. You may have noticed that I am an Austro-libertarian, but I do not necessarily go after minarchists or other general right-wingers that much. And the reason for that is because I like to separate all ideologies into three camps. There's the people who want more government globalist control than what we basically more clown world, the people who want to maintain that order, and the people who want to at least reduce it somehow. Your standard issue right-leaning classical liberal, they might not want to reduce that as much as I do, but they at least want to reduce it. And so making an enemy out of them is really stupid. And I really wish more libertarians would understand that. Another thing is to look at what BreadTube is doing right now and how they're actually kind of dying and not mimic the same mistakes. Because one issue of BreadTube is that they're increasingly spiraling into additional levels of progressivism, where the goal is to always one-up the next progressive, with more progressiver-than-thou logic, which has led them to adopting this sort of globalist, morally relativistic version of anarcho-communism, which has absolutely no chance of ever manifesting in reality. A way that I avoid that for myself is that whenever I think about possibly making a more X-than-thou argument, I always ask myself, does this really need to be said? Because a lot of the times it just doesn't need to be said. It just doesn't. No matter how correct you might think that you are, you also have to consider whether or not what you're about to say is productive or not. Next up, what do you think about Georgism and the land value tax? Well, as I said before, Georgism, I'm not a Georgist and I don't think it's the best system, but Georgism is a potential compromise system. So is it the best idea ever? No. Would it be better than what we currently have? Yes. That's pretty much it. It is the least aggressive form of taxation. Still aggressive, but not as bad as others. And Georgists are largely correct about zoning laws and not taxing property. And the arguments that Georgists put forth are at least economically correct for how what they would want would effectively solve the housing crisis. At least it would solve it a lot better than what leftists want. Let's have the government build houses. Yeah, no. Next up, what philosophical theory of morality do you hold to? So I kind of have my own ethical approach, but the best way to describe it is I am a natural law theorist that then branches into virtue ethics. But I place the importance of natural law above virtue. So, and the reason I like natural law, I mean, this, this is one of the most things that could be its own video, but natural law does a very good job of using reason to deduce what ethics should be. And then using that reason, you can usually deduce what virtues are necessary to maintain a libertarian order. That actually goes into one of the things that Hans Hermann Hoppe has said, in that a libertarian society will want to, or really have to, take certain steps to maintain the cultural dynamics that allowed their libertarian society to flourish and come to form. And the virtues that exist within that culture will likely play a very important role. I actually kind of have my own philosophy on this, but it is mostly natural law. What do you think of the LGBT movement? They have a right to be who they are, and everybody else has a right to freedom of association. Abolish the Civil Entitlements Act, and you'll find that a lot of these problems go away. Because while discrimination is generally not a nice thing to do, you can't force people to get along, especially when they have severe ideological or moralistic differences between each other. For instance, you could just as easily say Islam is right about LGBT. Well, how do you solve that? Well, freedom of association. That way Muslims have a right to be Muslims, and LGBT still has a right to be LGBT, but they don't necessarily have to be forced to be with each other 
all the time. Could you do some EU-themed episode? Eh, maybe. Again, I kind of have too many video ideas, I need to focus on one at a time, really. Next up, what do you think about the philosophy of algorithm? Uh, based, very based, algorithm is great. And also, uh, one note I'll say, because this is another one thing is to... I could give it its whole entire video on, but algorithm is one of those things that really exposes the fraudulence of those who call themselves libertarian leftists these days, but hate Bitcoin, even though cryptocurrency is one of the best inventions ever to escape the eye of the Fed. I am deeply disturbed by the fact that so many leftists can speak out against algorithm and cryptocurrency, while at the same time claiming that they're against government. It's just... Wow. Next up, the issue of fraud. How should that be handled? Well, consumers who are defrauded have a right to court for that. That's another just misconception of the Austrian model. It doesn't actually get rid of the necessary components of the government, such as courts where people who are defrauded can then press charges against those who have frauded them for violating contracts and whatnot. Those don't actually go away. They just get decentralized. So a lot of the basic functions of society and how certain rules are handled wouldn't actually change much, you would just have more choices. The only real major difference in that category is that it has to be focused on the consumer being defrauded, rather than someone who owns a trademark claiming that they've defrauded a consumer even if that customer doesn't actually feel like they've been defrauded. Or in other words, there's nothing wrong with the buying and trading of knockoff products. It's only when the consumer themselves has been defrauded, is there an actual problem? Like for instance, say that you want to purchase a knockoff iPhone, Apple doesn't really have a right to sue the person who sold you that knockoff iPhone. However, if you bought that knockoff iPhone not knowing that it was a knockoff iPhone, well yeah, then there's an actual problem there. Next up, do you have any lesser known channels to recommend for SnakeDube? You know what, I recognize that a lot of this video is a lot more complex questions and not exactly the most entertaining of answers, so I'm going to trip this up a bit, I'm going to recommend Low Time Preference Gaming. It's an excellent meme channel. So you can check that out if you just want some SnackTube stuff to laugh at. Next up, what is your education? In terms of official academics, I have a bachelor's and I studied IT, as well as some game design. However, it's more of an autodidact thing. To be honest, a person who is truly educated is someone who understands that you can't get your education from just academia alone. You have to actually teach yourself things. Those who think that you need to always go through official educational institutions to learn anything are suffering from the height of pseudo-intellectual midwittery, in my honest opinion, and I'm sure the opinion of many others. And as for the mass shootings, oh yeah, that's definitely a cultural issue. There's a very large amount of hard data that shows that gun rights don't have nearly as much of an effect on the amount of mass shootings as leftists like to claim. And yes, a lot of leftist policies lead to more broken homes and significantly less social trust. That is an issue as well. Next up, how do you think your viewers should educate themselves and do things in a similar manner to support the idea of people thinking for themselves as opposed to just blindly listening to my words. So that one, I'll just share a trick that I use to be less dumb. I'm basically always listening to some kind of informational podcast or some kind of audiobook that has a non-fiction bend to it. In other words, I'm always listening to something that's actually useful for understanding what's going on in the world. And I just multitask that. For instance, if I'm lifting or playing a video game or doing whatever on the internet at my computer, I'll also be listening to an audiobook or something in regards to economics or global affairs or whatever at the same time. That's what I do anyways, I'm always multitasking. And of course, the more you know and understand about the world, the more capable you become of thinking for yourself about it. Assuming that you have at least some kind of average level of rational ability. Next up, hey man, love your videos, channel came at a good time as I found myself falling down a bit of an economically left rabbit hole recently, mainly based on this sense of increasing corruption within our current system. Oh yeah, this is something I went over quite extensively in my Refuting Red Tube episode on Second Thought. One of socialism's biggest grifts is tricking people into thinking that socialism is a solution to government corruption. It is not. Socialism, once they actually put it into practice, all it really does is cede more power to the government. And any corrupt institutions that currently hold control over the government will of course just increase their stranglehold, so it doesn't actually help any. And he continues, I guess what I want to ask is, do you not feel like the current system is so firmly in the clutches of those powerful entities such that it is resistant to change? Does it not feel like the only changes that can be effectively brought about are the ones that this collusion of powers deems beneficial to their end goals? If not, how do you suppose we bring about valuable change? Oof. 
That's actually a difficult question because you're kind of bleeding into the Doomer mindset there. I do know a few people out there who really just kind of general on the, both all areas of the political spectrum, honestly, but especially on the right, just because we're more aware of it, are just kind of in the let's just ride the collapse mentality because we're doomed. Personally, I do like to believe that if we could convince enough people that the only way to really fix these issues is by reducing government power overall, then we might be able to get somewhere. But until then, enjoy the ride. All right, that's pretty much it. Lastly, I just want to say, don't feel bad if I didn't answer your question. If I didn't respond, it's because you either asked something that would require its own full video to explain, and I wanted to keep this within 30 minutes, or you asked something that somebody else asked, or you asked something related to personal information that I would rather not make public just yet. And now it's time for that channel update. So first off, my direction for the channel remains mostly the same. Refuting the various nonsensical propaganda that Clown World produces, that's going to continue refuting leftist talking points that I feel don't have a good enough refutation out there already. Yes, this means BreadTube episodes will definitely be continuing, and various right-wing and libertarian economic theory. And honestly, the only real difference here is I would like to push myself my videos more entertaining and enjoyable to watch, so I'll probably be including some more humor in the future in my videos, as well as just further making certain topics easier and more fun to understand. Another change I am making is in how I accept donations from people who want to support my content, and by the way, thanks to everybody who already has. Previously, I was just using PayPal, but PayPal has some irritating fees, and there was also some recent drama suggesting that PayPal not be as trustworthy as they claim. So I have now replaced this with a coffee page. All money I get from it helps me put aside more time to making these videos, so it's always helpful. I'm also focusing on cleaning up my Discord server a bit so that trolls and bad actors can't just come in and wreck the place. Anyways, that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and until next time.